Hello and welcome to Nick Snack for Neologism's episode 31, where we define and discuss the most amazing words in the English language. Last episode, we covered doppelganger, skullduggery, tomfoolery, rubberneck, and poppycock. And this episode, we're covering solipsism, epistemology, fallacy, and credulous, and sophistry. These are all sort of philosophical words, if you will, and I realized over the last few weeks, because of the mundaneness of my life, I've had a little bit of existential angst, and so I thought I'd start trying to think more philosophically, and I was like, you know what? We should do a podcast where we cover words that are philosophically related. So let's get on with our first word. Our first word is solipsism. It is a noun, solipsism. It's kind of a funny word to say. Got a lot of S's in it. If you say solipsisms, you've got four S's in one word. Solipsism, S-O-L-I-P-S-I-S-M. Solipsism, S-O-L-I-P-S-I-S-M. Solipsism. And it means the theory that only the self exists or can be proved to exist. The theory that only the self exists or can be proved to exist. It can also mean extreme preoccupation with and indulgence of one's feelings, desires, etc. Egoistic self-absorption. So when I think of solipsism, I just think of the idea that we only exist in our minds. And that, and that really is kind of the more philosophical definition of it. And you can see why extreme preoccupation with and indulgence of one's feelings might come if you had the belief that you only existed in your mind. Because then you are kind of the center of the universe. In fact, more accurately, you would be the center of the universe because it's only in this, in this solipsistic worldview, it is only your mind that is existing. So just let that sink in for a second. Let that, let that sort of permeate your mind as you think about God. Nothing exists in the world but my mind. Everything is just a figment of my imagination. It's kind of crazy, right? And you might even think, well, there's just me in this universe and I've got this body. No, you don't even have a body. You've got this mind. It's just your mind and everything is sort of an extension of your mind. So even your body, for instance, as an extension of your mind. Even people, others, are an extension of your mind. And if you apply it, really, if I'm talking right now, I'm not even talking. That's just my mind making things up, that there's this entity called me that is speaking. That is solipsism. And so you can see if you really entertain solipsism, how you would become very preoccupied with indulging your own wishes, fantasies, desires, etc., things like that. And I had this uh, friend of a friend or maybe a friend of my brother-in-law or something like that. He was an alleged solipsist. And I don't really think you can live solipsism 100% true, but I think there's some positives to it. I think it probably potentially could make you a little more confident in social situations. You just think, okay, everyone out there is a figment of my imagination and I can just, I can learn to interact with these figments in a socially acceptable way that might help with your social anxiety or something like that. I don't know. The guy seemed pretty confident to me, but I don't think you can really live solipsism a hundred percent truthfully because I think it just gets too weird. And not only that, but if everything is, if, if everything is a figment of your imagination, then really you are in, entirely in control of your own reality. And so when things don't go your way, because we don't have control of things external to us, right? wouldn't you get upset with yourself? And even that upsetness would just be a figment of your imagination. It's just crazy. I can't even, can't even think about it because I think solipsism is just that crazy. You just go down this weird solipsistic rabbit hole. Anyhow, our mnemonic for solipsism is you can think of soul I solipsism. At the very beginning of the word, it says soul I. So you can think it's only me. I'm the only thing that exists in the universe. And then that'll cue you into, oh yeah, I just exist in the mind, solipsism. Or the way I remember it is when I see solipsism, it makes me think of a lollipop. I don't know why, but it kind of, we've got the L-O-L-I in there. And for some reason, it makes me think of a lollipop. And I just think of a lollipop, you've got the big sort of part that you suck on, and then you've got the part that you hold, which is this tiny little stem. And that reminds me of, okay, we only, the big part, we only exist in our head. The big part reminds me of just a big mind and then the body doesn't really exist. The small little part doesn't exist. So that's how I remember it. Kind of a weird mnemonic. 
Maybe that's more of a personal mnemonic, but maybe that'll help you guys. I don't really know. Those who believe in solipsism may question the reality of everything around them, but they firmly believe in evidence of their own consciousness. Despite the chaos around him, Jonathan enjoyed his ice cream cone with that peculiar sense of pleasure known only to solipsists. It's not a matter of knowing whether or not you exist, said the solipsist. The only thing I know for certain is that there is some thing in this universe capable of thinking. I've had dreams resembling reality so much, I start to wonder if there is a difference between the waking world and the dream world, and it makes me think solipsism could actually be true. All right, so that's the word solipsism. Let's move on to our next word, which is epistemology, probably one of my favorite words. I say that so much, it's meaningless, but I love epistemology. It's a noun, E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-L-O-G-Y, epistemology, E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-L-O-G-Y, epistemology, and it's a branch of philosophy investigating the origin, nature, methods, and limits of human knowledge. So when I think of epistemology, I just think of anything that really relates to knowledge is epistemological. That's all I think about. It's like, how do we know what we know is an epistemological statement. How do we know what we know or epistemological question? And our mnemonic for this, the way that you can remember it, I think, is you can just think of epistemology, epistemology, epistemology. You can throw in that little fake K-N-O-W and then you'll remember, oh yeah, epistemology, knowledge. How do we know things? Epistemology, a branch of philosophy that investigates the origin, nature, methods, and limits of human Knowledge. So whether or not we like to acknowledge it, we all have what I would call implicit epistemological standards. And what I mean by that is we all have these standards of knowledge that we may or may not be consciously aware of. But once something satisfies those standards, then we hold it as true. So let me give you a concrete example so we can we can kind of reel this in and relate it to reality so that we're not so abstract about a very abstract term. So let's say you are a female and our best friend comes up to us and they're like, you're not going to believe what I saw today. I saw Jonathan, who is our significant other. We've been dating Jonathan for five years. We're deeply in love with him. But our, our best friend says that they saw Jonathan kissing a girl as they were walking by this ice cream shop to their dental appointment. The first thing that happens is we're like, holy crap, I can't believe my boyfriend of five years is kissing another woman. What's going on? But the first thing that happens, right, is we're going to ask our friend an epistemological question. We're going to wait. How do you know that was him? Are you sure it was him? That is an epistemological question. We want to know, right? We want to know, was that Jonathan or not? And your friend says, well, I was walking by and, I, you know, granted, I saw him 20 feet away, but it looked like him. And so you're going to keep asking these questions and maybe she's going to give you, your friend is going to give you a physical description that exactly matches Jonathan. And so maybe 80% of your implicit epistemological standards have been met. But to fulfill that other 20%, because there's going to be doubt, right? Like maybe your friend made a mistake. We all have our doppelgangers out there. Maybe it was someone who looked exactly like your boyfriend, but wasn't him. Maybe she was rushing by. She didn't get as good of look as she could have, but she swears it was him. You trust your best friend. But to fulfill that maybe 20% doubt that you have in your mind, you're going to ask Jonathan an epistemological question. Get down to business, ladies. We're going to get down to business. We're going to confront Jonathan. We're going to go up and ask him. We're not going to send him a text. We're going to go up and ask him and say, hey, Jonathan, hey, tell me about uh, tell me about that outing at the ice cream shop and that woman you were kissing. That is your epistemological question. And then based on the countenance of John right after you've asked him that question, you'll know, right? Does he look guilty? If he shows guilt or remorse of any kind, boom, you'll know. And then your implicit epistemological standards have been fulfilled and you know that Jonathan was a cheater or maybe... It was a doppelganger, and Jonathan's like, what? I was out with a buddy. We were eating pizza at the bar. I got a receipt to show you. All right? Maybe we're wrong. Anyhow, we all have sort of implicit epistemological standards. And I could talk about epistemology forever, man. It's crazy. Google epistemology. There's all sorts of different theories about how we acquire knowledge and stuff like that. What they recognize was that embedded in epistemology is a fundamental metaphysical component whose ultimate function is to provide a framework and strategy for creating well-being in society. What seems to be happening in the paper is that Sustine and Vermeule are confusing the term 
epistemology with belief system, which is a subject similar to ideology and is way beyond the scope of epistemology. The other type of theory or attitude towards theoretical physics is one that could be called epistemological, and these theories attempt to describe how the world looks to us rather than to God. What does an invalid epistemological statement look like? A question like this, does knowledge exist? This invalid epistemological question already assumes knowledge exists while asking if it exists. Yeah, that's quite curious. All right. So that's the word epistemology, and our mnemonic was epistemology, of or relating to or pertaining to knowledge. All right, let's move on to our next word, which is another great word, and it is fallacy. It is a noun, fallacious. You might hear a fallacious reasoning or uh, fallacious argumentation. Fallacious is the adjective, but it's spelled F-A-L-L-A-C-Y, fallacy. F-A-L-L-A-C-Y, fallacy. Deceptive, misleading, or false notion, belief, etc. That the world is flat was at one time a popular fallacy. Do you guys actually believe that? you think that's really true? Do you think people really believe the world is flat? How do we really know that? Do we have people back then chronicling what people were thinking and what their beliefs were? I don't think so. I think that's fallacious. I think that statement in and of itself is fallacious. I don't think that people actually believe the world is flat. Who knows? Not a historian, all right? None of us had a video camera back then. A misleading or unsound argument is also a fallacy. Deceptive, misleading, misleading or false nature, erroneousness, or in logic, any of the various types of erroneous reasoning that renders arguments logically unsound. Our mnemonic is fail to see. Fallacy, fail to see. You fail to see something because it's deceptive, it's misleading. It's fallacious, fail to see, fallacy, fail to see, fallacious. So if you Google fallacy, you'll get this long list of fallacies. I don't know how many there are, it's probably hundreds of them. And there's some very popular fallacies out there, and I would like to share two of them with you. The first one is known as ad hominem, and the second one is known as slippery slope fallacy. So the ad hominem fallacy is probably, I don't know, that's probably maybe the one that people use most often. And if I could give you a clear example would be this, right? You get someone who is corpulently obese, morbidly obese, and they are a nutritionist and they offer advice on what you should eat and dieting, right? Well, then someone might say, well, I can't trust a fat person when it comes to advice. I mean, look at them. They're just, they're too fat to trust their advice. But the reality is their nutritional advice is entirely separate from what they look like, right? In other words, someone's fatness does not have any bearing on the nutritional advice they may be giving. So you hear that one all the time. It's kind of frustrating. It's like you should be able to separate one's argument from one's appearance. And similarly, you might get it. You might get something like, well, uh, someone believes, I don't know, someone has some sort of ideology. And instead of questioning or looking at their, their ideology in and of itself, you look at the person who's who's making the ideological statements. Well, look at the dress they're wearing or look at the tie that guy's wearing. I can't believe anything that he says. That's a form of ad hominem. You're attacking someone's character, not their actual argument. I would say that's probably, don't you guys think that's probably the most common fallacy? You're just attacking someone's character. You're not actually looking at their argument. I mean, this is, this is like, pro, it's very prolific on YouTube. You see people do that all the time on YouTube. You look at the comment section. People can be kind of, just flagrant in that fallacy, just calling people names rather than really looking at the argument. The second fallacy that's pretty common is a slippery slope fallacy. And that's the one where you say, well, one action will lead to this, which will then lead to this. And the next thing you know, we're all going to die. So concrete example would be maybe smoking one marijuana joint. You guys have probably heard that, right? You can't let anyone smoke one marijuana joint because the next thing you know, they're going to be associating with other people who smoke marijuana who are going to have these heroin friends and then the heroin friends are going to introduce them to heroin and your son is going to die under a dark, wet, moist bridge injecting heroin all because of that one choice that you made. That's a slippery slope, right? You have no idea. We have no idea what's going to happen in the future or what one choice in and of itself may lead to. So that's known as the slippery slope argument. Or my God, you guys, you don't go to college, your life is ruined forever. 
You don't go to college, you won't get a degree, you won't get a degree, you won't get a job, you won't make money, you'll end up under that wet, moist bridge, just like that heroin addict. That is the slippery, slow fallacy. I feel like I'm going a little crazy right now. I am sleep deprived, so yeah, my mind's just kind of doing whatever. A subset of this fallacy is the pervasive view that securities trading is a zero-sum game. There are certain fallacious arguments which look hard to debunk at first sight, but aren't actually so. That type of argument is called a fallacious appeal to tradition because the question is not what has been done, but rather what is fair. So that is the word fallacy. Our mnemonic was fail to see fallacy. Yeah, it's a good word. All right, let's move on to our next word, which is incredulous. It's an adjective, incredulous, I-N-C-R-E-D-U-L-O-U-S, incredulous, I-N-C-R-E-D-U-L-O-U-S, incredulous, and it means not credulous, well, thanks, so that helps, not credulous, disinclined or indisposed to believe, skeptical, indicating or showing unbelief, an incredulous smile, when I think of incredulous, I just think of Wow, I can't believe something is true. That look you have when you're like, what? Seriously? That is an incredulous look. Someone tells you something just absolutely outlandish. The first way you're going to feel or look, that countenance on your face is going to be one of incredulity. That's the noun of incredulousness or incredulous. That, that look of incredulity you have, that look of disbelief, that is incredulous. When you're incredulous, you're like, what? That can't be true. Our mnemonic for this word is if you look at incredulous... It has the C-R-E-D word root to it. So we all know the word incredible, right? If something's incredible, it's it's, it's amazing. But I think incredible probably used to mean, and probably still does, not credible. Or, my God, we can't even believe it. It's not true. Incredible. Something is so untrue, it's amazing. Incredible. So something lacking credulity or lacking credibility You can see where that C-R-E-D comes in. So if you won the lotto, how would you feel? You would first feel incredulous, right? You look at your numbers, you'd be like, what? This can't be true. You'd be in utter disbelief. And then after, you know, following incredulity is ecstasy, I think. In that instance, you would feel ecstatic, right? After you wiped away your incredulousness, then you would be feeling ecstatic, Or maybe you were in a car wreck, right? Your car toppled over. You forgot to put on your seatbelt. Shards of glass were flying everywhere. And then somehow you popped out of your vehicle, got ejected from your car, and then you stood there looking at your car. Your car is a disaster. And you are are feeling profound incredulousness, profound incredulity at the fact that you're standing there alive, breathing without a scratch on your body. That would be incredulity. Miriam's envious friends were incredulous about her engagement to a wealthy doctor because she herself did not believe in medicine. The bank teller gave Kurt an incredulous look when he deposited a real check for $20 million. I could tell by my husband's incredulous smile that he had serious doubts about my excuse for coming home late. When my teenage daughter told me she had used my credit card to purchase a $300 pair of sneakers, I was incredulous. All right, so that's the word incredulous, and it means disbelief. And our mnemonic was cred. We remember cred having to do with belief. It's a word root, incredible. And incredulous means you're just against giving credence to something and therefore have disbelief about it. Let's move on to our next word. Our next word is sophistry. S-O-P-H-I-S-T-R-Y, sophistry, S-O-P-H-I-S-T-R-Y, it's a noun, sophistry, and it's a subtle, tricky, superficially plausible, but generally fallacious method of reasoning, a false argument, sophistry, so you can see the relation between fallacies and fallaciousness and sophistry. Anyone, I would argue, who employs fallacious reasoning on a regular basis is probably a sophist, someone who employs sophistry. So you might have a friend who likes to argue sort of all sides of things, right? And they can almost argue for anything and make it sound plausible. They might be a sophist. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to be a sophist. I think it does have somewhat of a negative 
connotation, but I don't think it's necessarily bad. I think it takes a lot of creativity and perspective and insight to be able to argue the various sides of different things despite what your own personal beliefs may be. So I think that's kind of cool. I think sophistry can be a positive thing. Our mnemonic for sophistry, as you can think of, there's, I got three, all right? You're going to have to pick the one that suits you. So there's so fish, so fishy trick, sophistry, so fishy trick. That'll cue you into, oh, it's trickery, so fishy trick, sophistry. It's a trick. It's not true reasoning. It's trickery, trick reasoning. Or you can think of so physics equals chemistry, which is not true, sophistry, so physics, chemistry. It's got kind of those three words in there. So physics equals chemistry, but that's not true. Or, and the way I remember it is I think a sophistry, I think a sophisticated. Sometimes we can be so sophisticated in our reasoning, it's just untrue. Sophistry, sophistication and sophistry. The people who have attained governmental power have demonstrated considerable skill and sophistry in order to obtain power that was not intended to be granted. This piece of sophistry from the Catholic League conveniently ignores the fact that there is no statistical correlation between homosexuality and pedophilia, and the majority of adults charged with sexual exploitation of minors are not gay but straight, including many who are married and have children of their own. Sophistry. So next time someone, someone says that that's not true and your argument's false, you might be sophistic. Or maybe they're sophistic. So that's the word sophistry. It relates to fallacies, of course. Anyone who employs fallacies on a regular basis might be a sophist. So that sums it up for our five words for episode 31 of Nick Snack for Neologisms. Let's review each word, see if we can remember the definition or perhaps the mnemonic. And our first word was solipsism. What was the definition of solipsism? I told you guys it reminded me of a lollipop. Soul I. Yes, you are the only thing that exists in the universe. It's only your mind. And if you are the only thing that exists in the universe, you might be a little self-absorbed. You might be a little egoistic. Solipsism. I've had dreams that resembled reality so much, I start to wonder if there's a difference between the waking world and the dream world. And it makes me think solipsism could actually be true. Solipsism. Our next word was epistemology. Epistemology. What was our mnemonic for that? I liked this one. This is a good mnemonic. Yes, our mnemonic was epistemology. We see that knowledge in there and that reminds us, yes, anything that pertains or relates to knowledge or how we acquire knowledge, that is what epistemology is all about. We talked about an invalid epistemological statement. Does knowledge exist? This invalid epistemological question already assumes knowledge exists while asking if it exists. Then our next word was fallacy. Fallacy, what does fallacy mean? Our mnemonic was fail to see if you fail to see something because it's deceptive or it's misleading or a false notion. It definitely is fallacy. And I told you guys, there's a long list of on Google. There's a long list on Google about all sorts of different fallacies. Google it sometimes and see which which fallacies you like to employ yourselves. I guarantee we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it all the time. I got my favorite fallacies. Our next word was incredulous. Incredulous. This one for our mnemonic has that special word root in it that has to relate to credence and credulity and belief and all that. If you're incredulous, you just win the lotto, you're going to be incredulous. Yes. It's that feeling of disbelief, utter disbelief. The bank teller gave Kurt an incredulous look when he deposited a real check for $20 million. Incredulous. And our last word was sophistry. Sophistry. And we had three mnemonics for this one. I hope you picked one that worked for you. So fishy trick. So physics equals chemistry and sophisticated. Sophisticated argumentation. Yes, a subtle, tricky, superficially plausible, but generally fallacious method of reasoning. Sophistry. All right, so that wraps it up for Nick Snack for Neologisms episode 31. Hope you guys enjoyed that or this philosophical episode. Thought it was kind of cool. I want to share with you one of our latest reviews we've received for NickSnackForNeologisms.com, written by Jan Fulmer 
on iTunes. And if you guys haven't already, please head over there and leave me a review. It helps others just like yourself find my podcast. And Jan says, Hi, Nick. I'm writing to you from Cape Town, South Africa. I am the host of the Just Vocabulary podcast. English is my second language. And I love the words you're sharing. I mentioned your podcast with my listeners on Just Vocabulary episode JV659. In this episode, I share the words connote and solemn. Those are two cool words. I have subscribed to your podcast and keep up the great work. Thank you, Jan. If you guys leave me a uh, review on iTunes, I might share it in our next episode. So please consider that and stay tuned for episode 32. Bye-bye.